Welcome to Pharmacy in Focus, where I will be having pocket-sized conversations on current topics and interests relating to pharmacy and the wider health sector. My name is Shreena Vassan, bringing you Pharmacy in Focus on behalf of the Pharmaceutical Society of New Zealand. Welcome to this episode of Pharmacy in Focus, how COVID-19 oral antiviral therapy reclassification from prescription to pharmacist only could reshape the future of pharmacy in New Zealand. On July 14th, 2022, the Associate Minister of Health announced that Numaltrevir and Ritonavir, brand name Paxlovid, and Molnupiravir, brand name Legevrio, were to be reclassified from prescription only medicine to pharmacist only restricted medicine within two weeks. The aim of this change was to increase timely access by allowing pharmacists to provide these oral antiviral medicines without a prescription to people who have COVID-19 and who meet the eligibility criteria set by Pharmac. Paxlovid in particular has a number of interactions and contraindications. Dose adjustments are required for those with renal impairment and it's contraindicated in hepatic impairment. Many of you will know that there is a comprehensive training on this at the Pharmaceutical Society. We know the scope of pharmacists has increased in recent years, such as the expansion of vaccinations that can be provided from pharmacists. However, it was this particular reclassification of Paxlovid, which made me wonder if this had now set a precedent for the future direction of pharmacy and the role of pharmacists within the New Zealand healthcare system. Will pharmacists' medication expertise be sought and appropriately funded? Do GPs, specialists, nurses and other healthcare professionals see pharmacists' contribution as being integral to the health and well-being of their communities? Today, I am joined by Professor Rhiannon Braund, the President of the Pharmaceutical Society of New Zealand. Let's see what she has to say about this. Welcome, Rhiannon. Thank you, Sharina. Rhiannon, what was your first reaction to finding out about the imminent reclassification of Paxlovid and Ligevrio? Um, well, I think like everyone, we were excited by the opportunity, uh, but the tight timeframes, of course, caused a little bit of concern. Um, what people might not be aware is, is that throughout COVID, um, PSNZ, both its exec and its operations team, have worked closely with the government and the ministry um, to provide solutions for them. But sometimes these conversations about what is possible um, don't always play out in, in quite quite a rapid uh, time frame as, as this one did. Um, and, and so it's quite interesting. We were, we were ha obviously happy to see the opportunity being put out to pharmacy. Um, but as I said earlier, the timeframes gave us a little bit of pause uh, because as you've mentioned, these are not simple medicines. Um, and so it was really important to make sure that we had good training in place, good systems in place, so that this could be done, uh, you know, safely through through community pharmacies. Thank you. Now, you've, you've talked about the the, the quick time frame um, and, and what the systems and, and the training, et cetera, that needed to be um, put in place. Um, can you explain why this reclassification took place at this time? Yeah, well, I think everyone's pretty aware of the strain that our entire health sector is under at the moment. Um, and I think when the ministry decided to make these medicines more widely available, it's really about meeting a patient need. And these medicines have to be started uh, really within the first couple of days, five days at a push. Um, and it became quite apparent that the sector just wasn't, the health sector wasn't able to meet the needs of, of patients in that, in that rapid um, time frame. One of the advantages, uh, which is we've seen through pharmacies right through the whole COVID, is the fact that we're accessible, um, we're late nights, weekends, uh, you know, we've really become a primary healthcare clinician um, that is autonomous and available. And I think that was a recognition that the government had that by making this uh, pathway available to patients, then they could get the medicines they need in a timely manner and take some of that burden away from others thinking about GPs, thinking about other um, access points into the system, but just taking away that burden from them um, and, and giving patients another pathway into the health system. Excellent. Thank you. And how have pharmacy staff been coping with this change? 
Well, I think it's a bit of a um, a mixed bag. You know, as I said, the whole health sector is under incredible pressure. Pharmacy is under pressure. We know we've got incredible workforce pressures and, and people are fatigued. Um, so for some pharmacies, they've seen this as an amazing opportunity and they've been ready to go. Other pharmacies, it's not a good fit for them right now. Um, and as, as you mentioned in the intro, there's a, there's a few things that come in the background of this medicine. These are time-consuming consultations. You need to have IT to port, port into some of the patient records. Um, and not all pharmacies have either the capacity or, or the infrastructure right now to be able to do that. So we've kind of had a bit of a mixed response um, as as to where people are at in, in, their, in their pharmacy setting as to whether they're able to, to jump on um, on this opportunity or if they just want to see how it plays out. Hmm. And so we've talked about pharmacy and the, and the incredible workforce pressure and, and being fatigued, how, how some have really taken this on board um, and maybe have already been working in that space already. Um, moving away from pharmacy in particular, what feedback have you received from other healthcare professionals around this reclassification? Yeah, it's, it's been quite interesting to me and uh, New Zealand doctor and of course pharmacy today were pretty quick to, to get some um, more wider opinions, um, not just from the pharmacy sector. Um, and I think what was interesting to me was that some of the GPs, or at least the ones that were quoted, not all GPs, um, were a little bit concerned about the level of clinical intervention um, that was needed. And some of the comments that came through uh, initially maybe didn't really understand the level of training that pharmacists had, the fact that actually we can read and interpret lab tests, that's part of our training, the fact that we actually have access to patients' clinical records, and we have had that for a while. Um, and I think it just came from a place of not being really clear about what pharmacy can do and should do. Um, you know, from the comments that came through, there was nothing that I read that was particularly um, negative. It was just about a lack of clarity, maybe, of, of roles in how um, how the systems might might talk, how how pharmacists can port into patient records. Like I said, um, you know, we've we haven't seen um, a huge amount of negativity, but there has been some friction. Um, but I think when you put the patient in the middle of it, uh, the, the reality is is that patients they can't get in to see the GPs. GPs are incredibly busy right now, um, and that if you think about it from a patient need perspective is actually quite quite a sensible approach. Indeed. Now, pharmacoscopes have expanded by being able to vaccinate for COVID-19, provide rats tests and, and now consulting and providing on antiviral therapy. And, and you mentioned before that you know, we are seen as more in integral primary care providers now. Uh, many are also working differently and providing virtual consultations. And the reimbursement model um, appears to be shifting and enabling more consultation-based funding for services provided. COVID-19 seems to be the driver for these changes, which, you know, as, as you have mentioned, you know, it's been incredible incredibly stressful times. However, it has put a spotlight on what pharmacists and pharmacy staff can do when they are enabled and supported. So what opportunities are there now for pharmacists and pharmacy moving forward? One of the um, things that's really struck me during COVID is that pharmacy have continued to step up and be present, be available. Um, and it has been really hard. It's been really hard for a lot of people, a lot of businesses. Um, but actually, what I have seen is the increased recognition that pharmacists are genuine primary care health professionals and that actually they have been underutilized. Um, they have been maybe maybe marginalized by some areas of the health sector. And the way the government has approached um what pharmacy can do and the expectations that they they you know what they're it's not so much trusting it's about what they they believe we can deliver for them um, has come through quite clearly and you mentioned this change in, in the way that some of the remuneration has come through um, and this is about paying us as clinicians this is about paying a primary care clinician to care for a patient um, we've had the historic contract model which was really about a service uh, supplier function um, and this is just a new way of recognizing that the clinical role that pharmacists have always done but I think we've actually been able to articulate quite clearly 
what the value add is and, and what, what the ministry is actually, um, or, or, or what they're buying for their patient, which is this increased timely, safe um, and appropriate access. Um, you know, and one of the things I didn't mention before was um, some of the negativity came around, oh, pharmacists can't deal with interactions, oh, pharmacists can't deal with renal impairments, and yet that actually that's pharmacist bread and butter. You know, we've spent five years learning how to be experts in medicines, um, and I couldn't tell you, you know, <laughs> hemiangioma from a something other oma, but I can tell you about interactions, and I can tell you about renal function, and I can tell you about just adjustments. So it's really, in my mind, um, recognizing and utilizing pharmacist skill set um, in a way that probably should have actually happened a long time ago. Mm. And you did touch on that before as well around the clarity of the pharmacist skill set and, and what we can do and uh, maybe that change of perception from what we Correct. can do versus maybe what uh, some may have seen um, or, or thought we could or could not do it okay. at the time. Yeah, That's absolutely right. Um, I was just going to say, Shereen, one of the other things, you know, that we talked about this, this remuneration and, and you might not be aware, but recently they've increased the, uh, the payment now for vaccines for the, I think it's the flu one. Um, and again, I think this really signals quite strongly that the ministry and the government are looking towards buying outcomes. Um, and so for them, it's not really which profession that delivers the service. It's about, is this the right person or the right clinician? For the patient at that time um, and that, that actually that's what they're purchasing for the patient is that access and you know it doesn't really matter for the vaccinations for example you know what they're buying is increasing the vaccination rate increasing that patient coverage and it doesn't matter so much whether it's a, a pharmacist or a pharmacy technician um, or a doctor that actually that's the you know it's the outcome for the patient that is what what matters and that sounds like it is is quite a, a big shift from what we have been used to, where where the payments are largely, um, or at least appears to be profession based. So to to know that the government is now looking for outcomes, regardless of where and who provides it, is you know that that the opportunities um, might, must obviously be a lot greater just from that perspective alone. Oh, I absolutely think so. Yeah. And with all that in mind. Where do you hope to see pharmacy five years from now? Right, Rhiannon's magic ball. Um, you know, it's quite interesting to me, and, and one of the things, I was fortunate to meet with Minister Little um, maybe about a year ago now, and I said to him, I want a system where patients only need to see their doctor when they're sick. Um, and he laughed at me. And one of the things is that we have um, created a system where patients have to go and see a GP for, for prescriptions to, to access medicines, and they don't actually need that level of clinical intervention. So, you know, I think about my, my common or minor ailments, um, and I, I see a real need for pharmacy to be that primary care professional part of a team that actually patients can come to us and we can triage, and if they need to see their GP, we refer them to the GP. If they need to go to ED, we refer them to ED. Um, and that actually pharmacy plays a really key role as a port of entry into the health system. Um, and that doesn't mean that we can do everything a doctor can do, but there are a lot of things that patients don't need that level of clinical intervention for. Um, so that to me is my my big, big thing, is that you should go and see your doctor when you're unwell. Um, and I think that's sort of the message that we're seeing coming through, that if we can provide access points for people, um, they can get what they need and it's safe, timely, appropriate, all of the safety you know, um, concerns are addressed, then I don't see any reason why pharmacists can't just take on more and more. Thank you for that, Rhiannon. So you know, you've, you've touched on access points and the, the safe and, and timely and uh, appropriate um, le level of care um, and it was really interesting to hear you say you should only you know you, you want to see patients only go to a doctor when they're actually sick and that really is sort of looking at well what what is the skill set of of a pharmacist or pharmacy technician for, for that matter or other healthcare professionals in relation to the GP and we know that the GP workforce is under stress um, and, and every workforce is under under stress admittedly yeah. um, However, you know, there, 
there is a, a place for pharmacy and, and you mentioned minor ailments um, as, as one example. So to be able to go to pharmacy for certain minor ailments pharmacy and if you first. need to be, yes, pharmacy yeah. first, yeah. if you need to be referred elsewhere, then to be that sort of triage point to, for that referral as well. And I, and I think, you know, we've got a lot of perverse incentives within our health system and we see the, the incredible workload that's happening through ED at the moment. Um, and that's because there's no part charge there. And if we have a system where funding truly follows the patient and actually things are low cost or no cost um, through pharmacies, you know, you can still have that clinical intervention, that same level of care, but we actually save the EDs of people that really need to be at at an ED and that aren't mm. there simply because that's the only option for them um, from a financial point of view. The other thing I'm really strong on is around this continuation of supply of medicines and, you know, we've got a lot of patients who are on long-term meds. New Zealand has got the shortest period of supply, um, the three months and then another script. Um, and actually, why can't we do a repeat from the pharmacy at that three month mark. Um, and I've seen some, you know, some commentary around that. There's so many, there's so many wins in that system, right? Mm. Um, and so one of the things that obviously is coming in later in the year is the TPB, the Therapeutics Products Bill. And of course, what that means for us, and that's obviously going to replace the Medicines Act, the opportunities that may come through that for um, looking at some of these uh, historic rules that maybe don't reflect um, good practice, practice nowadays um, is going to be quite important for pharmacy to to get those things across in front of and excuse me in front of the team that's that's putting that together now. Great, that, thank you. Um, and you will be no, no doubt looking very closely at what happens in the TPB in the coming months. Yes, and you know it's it's been quite an interesting process, and, and you know I don't know how, how many people are aware that they they thought they were at a 90% version maybe two years ago, two and a half right. years ago, and it didn't um, didn't fly very well with um, people reading it. So they sort of went back to the drawing board. Um, but it, it needs to happen. There needs to be a change. Um, but but making sure that it's enabling and not restrictive is going to be really important. I think, um, especially from that medicine supply, um, thinking about excess equity, thinking about you know how how we you know, how we treat medicines. They're not a simple commodity. Um, they actually have significant impact um, in making sure that we are a little bit more thoughtful about the way that we access and, and use medicines. Right. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode. So thank you so much for your time today, Rhiannon, and sharing your thoughts on what the future could hold for pharmacy. Thank you.